Hi, I'm Bill Stanjakevich, Assistant Dean for External Relations at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Patrick Dwyer, who serves on the faculty of our school, conducting primary research and teaching our students in the area of philanthropic studies. And Dr. Dwyer, thanks so much for being with us. And you know, one of the things I always wonder about with my colleagues is what led you to this point uh, to become a premier researcher in philanthropic studies as well as teaching our students how did you get here? Sure, great question. Um, there are really a number of different experiences that I had that led me to this point. Um, first was my undergraduate coursework in psychology. So I'm a social psychologist, but actually when I started college, I was going to be a math major. Um, and so I'd taken a couple math courses. I didn't actually get around to taking psychology until my sophomore year. But as soon as I took that first course, I was hooked. Um, there was something about being able to study human nature through the scientific method um, that I found really interesting, and especially social behavior. Um, so social psychology is really um, the study of everyday social behavior. And so even things like philanthropic studies, giving, volunteering, helping others kind of, kind of, kind of falls under that umbrella. And so this would be an opportunity to use science to answer questions like, why do people help others? And so moving on from there, I ended up having several research experiences as an undergrad that I was fortunate to have in a lot of different areas of psychology. Um, so things within social psychology, but also cognitive psychology, so things about learning and memory, as well as sleep uh, research, which we might think of as being very kind of removed from philanthropy, um, but people do spend a lot of their time sleeping. And go, after college, I continued doing research, but also had um, several travel experiences. So that's another thing that was important to me in my early 20s, since I didn't do much traveling as an undergrad. Um, I didn't study abroad, mainly because I was involved in so much research. Um, so I wanted to do some traveling um, in my early 20s, went to Europe a few times, and one of those experiences involved some volunteering. Uh, so I spent a couple weeks uh, working with a team of volunteers from the U.S., teaching English in a public high school in Italy. And so that experience really got me thinking back to some of the questions that I had um, thought about when I was in, in college studying psychology, um, things like why do people help others, why do they engage in something like volunteerism, uh, which can be very costly for volunteers, especially if they're halfway around the world doing it. Um, and how can these types of activities be promoted, since they seem to be so beneficial to the recipients and to society at large? And so it was those questions that I was having at that time that really motivated me to go back and get a PhD, and that have uh, informed a lot of my research ever since then, uh, up to this day. How is social psychology similar or different from sociology? When you talk about the study of how people act and interact, what are the similarities and what are the differences? That's a great question. So um, both of them focus on social or societal influences um, on uh, people, but psychology or social psychology really takes as its unit of analysis, the individual person. Um, because after all, it is a branch of psychology, which is ultimately concerned with human behavior. And so social psychology focuses more on how aspects of a, of a person's, say, immediate environment affects their behavior. And then also at the same time, how do features of that person affect their behavior? And sometimes how do they interact with those um, social or situational features? Sociology from what I understand, is concerned with um, more macro um, societal types of influences um, on people. And when we think about philanthropy then, whether that's a donor who's donating money, a volunteer volunteering time, an advocate volunteering their voice, we often wonder what motivates somebody to do that. In fact, fundraisers mm -hmm. know the phrase donor motivation. Yep. It seemed to me motivation is informed by psychology and social psychology. Is that correct? Absolutely. So there's quite a bit of research in social psychology on um, motivation in general, and then also on volunteer motivation, and more recently moving into 
motivations for donating money. And one, I think, core theme of a lot of that research is that philanthropic activity, whether it be volunteering, donating, can be motivated by a lot of different reasons. And so you can look at two different people who are engaging in the same type of philanthropic behavior, like volunteering, maybe even for the same organization doing the exact same thing. But the reasons underlying their behavior could be very different. And so there are several motivations for volunteering that have been identified. We often think of them as ranging from more self-oriented uh, to more other-oriented or more egoistic to more altruistic is one way of thinking about it. But they also break down into more specific kinds of uh, categories. And getting a sense of what motivates a person uh, to volunteer can be really helpful if you want to um, encourage them to sustain that behavior over time. And so I think it really comes down to motivation, especially with something like volunteerism, which is typically, you know, does typically unfold over a long period of time and is costly. And so that begs the question, well, why would someone uh, decide to volunteer initially if it takes time, uh, takes time away from activities they could be, um, you know, spending time with family, spending time at work, engaging in hobbies or other activities. Why would they decide to get involved in this behavior for the benefit of another person um, or, an, or an organization where they're not getting paid for it? And so that why question, I think, really boils down to a question of motivation or what's driving them. Are those motivations similar or different from when we look at demographic lists? You know, when we think about, you know, somebody of a higher income might be more likely to be philanthropic or somebody of a certain gender or of a certain race or a certain level of education. You know, some of these, you know, demographic characteristics that we see, uh, is motivation aligned with that or is this a separate category altogether? Um, it's a separate category, but I think there are some relationships to some demographic groups. And so the motivations that I'm thinking of um, have to do with underlying, say, social or psychological reasons why a person would volunteer. So something like volunteering um, because their friends volunteer or because they want to expand their social network, more social reasons, or volunteering because um, it makes them feel good, right? It makes them feel like they're making a difference. Um, so more, those would be more personal kind of esteem-based reasons. Or just volunteering um, to get your foot in the door with a certain career, um, career path, right? More career-oriented reasons. Or because it's something you really, you know, that's really important to you, you care about it, you really um, have compassion for people in need, and that's an important value of yours, right? And so these all have more of a psychological or social flavor to them. But research has found that some of these motives do tend to be more widely endorsed by certain demographic groups. So for example, um, older adults or older people who, who volunteer tend to be more motivated by um, community concern and the desire to give back. Um, whereas younger volunteers tend to be more concerned with social and career oriented. Um, types of reasons for getting involved. And that's not to say that all members of these demographic groups, you know, have that one predominant motive, but just on average, they tend to be more common uh, among certain demographics. So there is some overlap. And so I think that if you can't, um, say, survey a person as to their motives or have a conversation with them individually, um, that give you a chance to kind of hone in on them, um, we can use demographic characteristics to help kind of make educated guesses as to what a person's motives might be. And this whole issue of motivation, we've been talking from the context of the donor, of the volunteer, of the advocate. I would also think that the nonprofit leader, the fundraiser, has to have motivation themselves, right, to care about those things. So it would seem that, you know, to care about the other person, to be others focused. So it would seem that Motivation is in both sides of this equation uh, as we think about, you know, philanthropic relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, fundraisers 
could also potentially be characterized by some of these similar motives, um, like altruistic values um, or uh, concern about a particular cause that's really you know, that they identify with quite a bit. But then we can also think of social kinds of forces that might influence people. Um, and so another area that I've researched is, is gratitude. And so that's something that um, we can see influencing kind of both sides of, of that equation, right? Fundraisers, uh, as well as donors, could be, you know, could be motivated because out of feelings of gratitude that they have um, for benefiting in their own life. Um, and so they want to make a difference as either a fundraiser or a donor. Or perhaps they've been on the receiving end of, of gratitude expressed to them by another person. And so if you're a fundraiser and you've um, raised a lot of funds for a cause, then you might have been on the receiving end of gratitude um, from the beneficiaries of, of those funds. And same on the case of the donor. And so it's possible that that might come into, come into play too, as well as other kinds of social or relational kinds of factors. You know, you have people hear a term like gratitude and think, well, who can be against gratitude? It seems pretty straightforward, but your research shows the complexities of this and how gratitude is expressed, how gratitude is received. The timing of the gratitude being expressed and received really demonstrates uh, the complexity of the issue. And Dr. Dwyer, how do these issues, you, know, you talk about motivation, gratitude, your other areas of research, how do these then translate for you when you teach for us in the classroom? Do you have specific courses on these topics? Is your research folded into a broader range of subject material? Help our audience understand your approach in the classroom, please. Sure, so one theme of all of my courses is motivation. And this idea that I mentioned that there are several you know, kinds of motivation that could underlie a person's philanthropy. And I think, so I teach courses on individual donors as well as institutional donors. And I think that idea is true of both. So whether it's a person who's volunteering or making a gift, or whether it's an institution who gives out grants, um, like a foundation or a corporation, there could be a range of motivations underlying um, get that giving. And so if you're a fundraiser of either you know, seeking funds from institutions or individuals, getting a sense of the motives behind uh, the gift, why that person or institution gives, is going to be very helpful. And then on the gratitude side of things, so that's something that I've also started incorporating into my courses because we'll often read that nonprofits or fundraisers don't always express gratitude effectively. And as a result, they can kind of run the risk of, of losing donors. And so I've started to incorporate uh, research from, uh, from uh, emerging research on gratitude and specifically kind of like you were saying about different aspects of the quality of a gratitude expression or um, the timing of a gratitude expression that can affect its, um, you know, how it affects people's relationships and whether a person is more likely to give. I know that your research has focused on philanthropic behaviors. And when we think also about topics like motivation and gratitude, we can also think about leading our teams. And I know a lot of our alumni move into leadership positions. And uh, I've been struck in the literature by, you know, kind of the antecedent of all social influence theory goes back to Triplett back in 1898 when he noticed he rode his bicycle faster when there were other people on the track. And that sort of started this idea of being motivated by others and being influenced by others, which mm -hmm. led to this whole big scale of social influence leadership theory. Uh, how do you think about your work, and especially as you're working with our students, in terms of how this applies to leadership and not just how they're gonna be working with donors and volunteers or as donors and volunteers themselves, but should they become that chief development officer or that CEO and now they're leading the team? Yeah, so that reminds me of a, of a couple things um, that have come up both in my research and my teaching. And so first is this idea of social norms, uh, which can be very powerful influences on people's behavior. And what I mean by social norms are um, people's perceptions of how other people tend to behave. And so if people see that, you know, a lot of other people are giving to a particular cause, then they might use that as a signal for where they should be donating their money or how they should be behaving, um, especially when it's ambiguous. And I think that can be 
um, true uh, in the nonprofit sector when you have so many different causes to give to, um, right? And not a lot of time to do research into all of them. And it's um, people sometimes find it very easy to then just look to how other people are behaving and use that as a cue to, uh, this is where, where my money should be going to. Um, this, this idea of social influence also folds into the idea of leadership, um, and in particular transformational leadership that has been found to be particularly effective um, as a leadership strategy, both of paid employees, but also of volunteers um, and people work um, at nonprofits. And it's often contrasted, so transformational leadership is often contrasted with uh, transactional leadership, which really is a rewards and punishments um, based leadership strategy. But when you think about nonprofits, especially volunteers, um, you know, the rewards in terms of a living wage or getting paid, you know, that's removed. The punishments are also in many cases removed because what are they gonna get fired? I mean, they could just as easily leave. And so other leadership strategies have been considered uh, such as transformational leadership, which has more of an identity-based um, aspect to it and the transformational leadership leaders will try to align the work that a person's doing, whether an employee or um, a volunteer with that person's values. And so ultimately the work gets, is more likely to be internalized. But then the transformational leader is also someone who sets an example and will serve as a role model. And so typically this is someone who um, is kind of a prototype or an obvious example of a member of that group. And so, as a result, this can be motivating to the individual, but then also can help kind of bring groups together um, and develop a shared identity among people such as volunteers or, or workers at a nonprofit. And as we can hear from Dr. Dwyer's explanation of his research portfolio, including that wonderful description about how this applies to philanthropic behavior and to leadership, you can see that pursuing an academic degree from the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy is, is not teaching the how, the steps of management, but teaching the what and the why uh, and the complexities in that and no easy answers and no clear cut solutions, but using this evidence based research uh, to help us think through these complex topics to be effective in the philanthropic sector, uh, including as donors and as volunteers or uh, as employees of philanthropic organizations, including in leadership positions. Dr. Dwyer, take us inside the classroom. Think of one of your favorite modules or you know, maybe the first day of class uh, and give us a sense of, of uh, what some of those key points are if we're fortunate to be in your classroom. Sure, and I think this builds on what you were just saying about uh, kind of incorporating research-based strategies um, and sometimes uh, strategies or, you know, uh, partial answers to questions that I think give students something to grapple with while they're in the classroom. And so one thing that I like doing is incorporating new research findings into my courses, which kind of encourages students to think about concepts in new ways, but doesn't always give them a complete answer to a question, um, but gives them, kind of puts, puts the question to them and gives them an opportunity to think about well, does this apply to my work or, or not? What kind of evidence um, would make me more confident that um, it, is, it would be useful incorporating into my work? And so let me give you an example. So um, certain features of gratitude expressions have recently been found to be particularly useful at building relationships. Um, so close relationships like romantic relationships. Um, and there's been a few studies looking at this, but it's all been really within the close romantic relationship area. And of course, there are a lot of other relationships that people uh, are part of. And one of those is, you know, fundraising relationships between donors and um, fundraisers. And so this begs the question, well, do those same dynamics apply, right? Mm -hmm. And so are those same features of gratitude expressions effective for, you know, for building those kinds of relationships too? And so to give you a little taste of this research, basically in the same way that 
giving motivations that we've talked about can, can differ between being more self-oriented or more other-oriented, so can expressions of gratitude. And so um, when you thank a person, you could talk about all the benefits that you yourself received from a gift, right? If you got a new hat, you could talk about, you know, how much you enjoyed the style, how much you liked showing it off to other people, how warm it kept you during the winter, all these benefits that you yourself received. Or you could talk about what the gift says about them and how they're always doing nice things like this, how generous a person they are, um, how, how thoughtful they are, and how great it was that they remembered what style you liked. And so in both cases, you're thanking the person, but they're two very different kinds of expressions. And what this research has found is that these other focused or other praising kinds of gratitude expressions are actually more effective at promoting a relationship between two people. And this has been called putting the you and thank you, which I think is a, a clever way of thinking about it. Um, but like I said, this, all this research has been done in the context of close romantic relationships. And so that begs the question, well, you know, would this still um, be effective to use these kinds of, of gratitude expressions uh, as a fundraiser? Right, if you're trying to promote a relationship with the donor, or there might be certain might there be certain times um, or with certain kinds of donors who these expressions um, might be more useful. And so I'm I'm currently testing this in several studies. I don't know the answer yet, um, but these are the kinds of, thing, of things that I like to discuss with my students. Um, there are also other aspects of gratitude expressions, right, that you alluded to before that appear to make them more effective. Um, and so I like discussing those with students as well. And I haven't done this yet, but I am thinking of incorporating a thank you note assignment in which I have students develop a thank you note uh, based on this research or, and based on their own experience, um, kind of what would, a, what would an uh, ideal thank you note look like uh, to them and why. And exploring these topics related to motivation, related to gratitude, not only just inform the academic side of the Lilly Family School Philanthropy, but also our executive education through the fundraising school, where our founder, Dr. Henry Rosso, said that fundraising is the gentle art of teaching the joy of giving. And that art comes through in understanding motivations and reasons why people would want to donate and would want to volunteer. Dr. Dwyer, kind of a last question then, what does success look like for you with our students, whether it's in the classroom, other academic engagements at events and other academic activities, or even when they are alumni and they're either you know, in the academy pursuing their own research or out in the professional field, working almost always in the philanthropic sector, what does success look like for you as you serve our students? Sure, so what I'm trying to achieve with my students is a deeper understanding of what makes donors tick. And so what drives their giving? And the answer to this might, might be, uh, you know, personal reasons like motivations, it might be more social reasons like social norms, leadership, gratitude's interesting because that's kind of a personal as well as a social um, motive. And so an understanding of the different um, kinds of things that could motivate um, donors as well as volunteers. So when I say donors, I mean donors of, of money as well as time. And then combining that with practical strategies that they can use to help donors engage in philanthropy that's meaningful to them. And that's sustained, sustained over time. And this gets back to the, I think, the art of philanthropy um, in that, and also kind of gets back to the questions that I was talking about earlier that kind of you know guided me into this uh, field. Why do people help others? Why do they volunteer? How can we promote volunteering? And um, really understanding each of these questions helps kind of understand the other because I think through a greater understanding of what makes donors or volunteers tick, um, that helps us develop strategies that can keep them satisfied and happy uh, with their philanthropy. And then that also um, often will feed back into uh, more, philanthropic, more philanthropic activity in the future, which benefits um, 
fundraiser, the organization, the ultimate recipients of uh, that activity. And then researchers also found that it, you know, often will benefit the donors themselves. And so that's really what I'm trying to achieve with my students. Well, I have learned a lot just in this interview, or I, I know our audience has as well. So make sure I do this properly. Here's my submission to the assignment. Thank you, Dr. Patrick Dwyer, uh, for your expertise, which has enriched us greatly, uh, while also demonstrating uh, the unique characteristics of pursuing an academic degree. With Dr. Patrick Dwyer at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, I'm Bill Stanjakovich.